Hello, everybody. My name's Tony Nichols. I'm a pathway support social worker at Monk Wee Math Hospital in Sunderland. And I started working for, for CNTW in this role in September 2019. Previously, I'd worked for a local authority for, for 10 years in adult services and covered a variety of different roles within that, um, within that time. Um, learn disabilities, physical disabilities, best interest assessor. Um, however, my main focus and interest has always been with older people in dementia care. So for that reason, when this job became available, I, I jumped at the, opp the opportunity. Not only did it mean I could remain within an area that I felt passionate about, it also gave me the opportunity to, to develop a new role um, and, and a new career pathway for myself. The reason that this role was created was to improve the, the communication between inpatient and community services by working in a more collaborative way with the community teams. And the goal was to improve the quality of patient stay in hospital. Some of the development things, development ideas that I've been able to implement since coming into the team is an early identification of social care involvement and if there is no social care involvement a referral into social services to get that ball rolling at a very early stage within somebody's admission and and to get those social care assessments on on the go whilst somebody is is in hospital and and undergoing treatment I've been able to provide quite a lot of support and, and advice to patients and, and their carers whilst they're going through that, that hospital journey um, and providing support to carers who then need to source care packages or look for alternative placements for their relatives. Um, some of the other things that I've been able to do is a little bit of education just around social care process for, for the inpatient wards. So the ability to explain to the wards that social work assessment process, how we go about getting funding, how we have to source care providers, how we have to find placements and how long that journey can take because sometimes just that little bit of education around that can can make that relationship that little bit better. I've also been able to do that for the social workers coming into the hospital. A lot, Some of the social workers that come in are maybe newly qualified or don't have a lot of experience in working within that hospital setting. So I've been able to provide some information around what the different types of meetings are that we, that we ask the social workers to attend, who the different professionals are and what those professionals can 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 be used for to do your your social work assessment, but also providing them sort of just some general advice around mental health legislation, funding criteria, section 117, all, all of those different things that you would get involved with in, in an inpatient setting. About a year into the job, I thought it would be a, a good idea to evaluate the pathway support social work role. As it was a relatively new role, I wanted to get some feedback from the inpatient team and the community teams about how it was working and to see whether they felt the role was beneficial and whether they had any constructive feedback on how the role could be developed further. What I hope to do is raise the profile of this type of, of post to be able to have a social worker in all inpatient settings, as I strongly believe that it's um, it's added some benefit and, and it, there's, there's definitely an added benefit to having a social worker within that inpatient team. So the evaluation actually went out last week, so I'm still waiting for, for that feedback to come back, but hopefully we'll have that in the next week or so. Some of the benefits that we've we've already been able to evidence through the, the pathway work um, is that there definitely has been that improvement in the communication between the inpatient teams and the community teams. Um, the uh, uh, verbal feedback from from the team from the community teams has been that they've they've liked having a consistent person that they can go to. A lot of nurse and staff work shifts, so they'll they'll speak to one nurse one day and then it's a different nurse a different day and you can get slightly different information. So they like the fact that I'm there Monday to Friday, nine to five, and, and they have a, a consistent person that they can go to if they need some advice or they need some information or they need something doing on the wards. We have been able to evidence, or we, we were able to evidence a, a decrease in length of stay. That, that, that 
has slightly been skewed by COVID and, and obviously um, inpatient stays has varied over the last year. The had, because of that, though, we have been able to evidence that there has been an improvement in patient stay, that there hasn't been those delays um, in, in getting somebody back home where they want to be. I've also been making sure that we, we include our, pa our patients, our carers, advocates in that pathway process and, and get their voices heard through that. There's also we've also um, been able to prevent any bed shortages within the hospital. So it's it's making sure that people not only are able to are able to remain in their own locality, um, so that they don't have to travel to go to hospital or their relatives don't have to travel for visiting. Um, and it helps to prevent delayed discharges. So what I'm hoping to do with my role is identify some of the things that can cause delays at an earlier stage and, and make sure we try and do things that are preventative. Last year, CNTW wanted to do a piece of work to try and raise the profile of social workers within the trust. There was around, there, there are around 80 social workers who work um, for CNTW in a variety of different roles. The interviews that took place were a way to highlight some of these roles and evidence that social work skills can be transferred into a variety of different careers. Some of these include um, community therapists, community practitioners, care coordinators, clinical leads and managers, just to name a few. Um, the interviews are on the CNTW website and I believe the links are going to be posted into the, the comments if, if anybody's interested and wanted to give them a read. Some of my reflections on just today and and the and in, and international women's days. I just wanted to say a big thank you to to Social Work England really for the opportunity to speak today, um, especially on International Women's Day and with the upcoming Social Work uh, World Social Work Day. As a professional woman, as a, a mother of a young daughter, and a, a, I'm seven months pregnant as well, it is important for me to obviously raise the profile of women in leadership, and it is important for me to, to be a good example to my daughter in, in my own life. So it's just been a real honour and a privilege for, for me to, to have this opportunity today. So I just want to say a big thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, Philippa, I think you are on mute. Thanks, Tony. Um, I think that was a really um, helpful kind of introduction. And we do apologise for those of you that have tuned in late, maybe expecting to hear um, Chantal talk about developmental trauma and the pathway to homelessness. Um, but unfortunately, Chantal wasn't able to be with us today. Um, and so we were really pleased to have Tony step in at the last moment um, and provide an overview of her experience as a social worker who previously worked in a in the local authority and move to work for the trust. So thank you very much, Tony. Um, and we're going to provide opportunity for questions at the end of the session because we've got three speakers during today's speakers corner. Um, so thank you, Tony, for sharing your story today. And I'm now going to move to our second speaker, who is um, Sarah Crockford from, um, I think it's Hampshire, who is going to do a presentation. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah and I've stopped sharing. So Sarah, hopefully the tech will work and you will I share so. and lead us in your presentation. Hi there. Hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see you all. My name's Sarah Crockford um, and I'm a learning and development officer for Hampshire Adults Health and Social Care Department. Um, and before I start, I want to make a sincere apology um, for the hecklers in the background, which is my nine month old Jack Russell and my two year old Cockrell, um, who have decided to have a competition in the garden as we speak. Um, so I'm just going to bring up my slides for you. If I know you can perhaps give me a thumbs up to say that you can see the slides. Yeah. All right. So um, 
my 15 minutes is to talk about uh, staff wellbeing, which I think has been a huge thing, um, especially in the last year. Um, and I'm going to focus on what Hampshire adults have done um, in terms of trying to support our amazing social workers during COVID-19 and kind of our thoughts and feelings beyond really that. Um, I wanted to sort of start off by saying national statistics that have been out in terms of how social workers have been feeling about their work life, about uh, their well-being and their resilience. Um, the national statistics were very much reflecting our own surveys we were carrying out in that um, some people were feeling perhaps more negative about their work life in the last year and recognising that their mental health um, was less, uh, you know, was uh, significantly more prevalent and also recognising the increased levels of need uh, from the people we support. Um, but, you know, pleasingly in some ways, uh, a kind of um, over half were saying that they were fairly satisfied with how we'd responded and adapted uh, to the ongoing pandemic context. And we were lucky that um, all our practitioners have um, hybrids. Um, we already had Teams, Microsoft Teams in place, so that, that probably helped us um, a little bit um, at the start um, to, to get going, really. Um, the main issues that were coming up for staff, again, probably what was reflected nationally, was the, uh, the challenge of managing work and the family life. Um, because, you know, obviously the pandemic wasn't just happening to the people we work with, it was happening to us too. Um, all of the health and safety um, requirements, um, you know, keeping up with any potential Care Act easements, although we didn't have to really use any uh, easements within our local authority and still happen to this day, but there were an awareness um, of potential policy changes, etc. PPEs, um, visits, you know, when to visit, when not to, and that disconnect between the team uh, and other colleagues, really, and not that kind of connection we have in the office. Assessing virtually IT challenges, even though we had the hybrids. Everyone felt very tired, and especially, I think, in the second lockdown, that was an increasing um, kind of thing that was coming through. Working with grief and loss, um, you know, a lot of people were experiencing loss and changes because of lockdown um, and experiencing it firsthand as well within our own families and personal relationships. And something I wanted to kind of quickly reflect on in a bit more detail was this thing around secondary trauma. Um, and I think, you know, that what we're very mindful of is that uh, the, the sense of trauma around the people we are working uh, with um, has definitely increased but also that compassion fatigue and the effect in terms of secondary trauma on professionals themselves. And you know, we did a lot of research really and we reflected on the fact that um, our indicators for sort of sickness and mental health uh, reports were slightly on the up at the latter past uh, time of last year. Um, so we're very aware um, <clears throat> that our teams are tired um, they're exhausted and, you know, the lockdown has, has really continued for a lot longer than I think than anyone expected. Um, but we also saw there was opportunity um, if we supported our teams right, um, then uh, hopefully we could uh, actually work through lockdown and the trauma of lockdown um, and develop some good supportive networks really. Um, because it's not so much research tells us how much uh, trauma that our practitioners experience, it's how they're supported to do so. So I think that's really important. So we knew uh, the kind of things we needed to do really, and that was echoed in Earl's research really back in 2017. Um, and we've thought about how can we get this across our 400 plus workers uh, especially as we're in lockdown, you know, how can we um, provide some of the things uh, like reflective supervision and giving them that sense of support. So we came up with a wellbeing hub um, by April 2020 
um, and it was online um, um, and our team, the practice excellence team, were offering one-to-ones, wellbeing sessions, um, online telephone calls, etc. And we were feeding back to our departmental management team as well. Um, the online hub um, was on our web pages that people could refer themselves, they didn't have to wait for their teams. Um, and we could provide reflective sessions online using teams, one-to-ones or group sessions. Um, and also within that, if they didn't want us to do it, uh, they wanted them to do the wellbeing sessions themselves, we gave them some tips on how to conduct those reflective sessions themselves. And there's an example for you. Um, we also used the hub um, and put all the kind of hyperlinks, if you like, about well-being, um, working parents, um, you know, breathing techniques, um, coping as key workers, anything that we thought was of importance, we we sort of slap on the page so that they could they could use that if needed. The sessions themselves varied really. When the teams referred themselves to us, um, we kind of listened to what they wanted and we used various types of exercises within that. I think the most common thing we used a lot was the Cooper Ross um, model reminded them really of what they were experiencing as, as well as the people they work with. Very much used the control and influence uh, um, circle um, to talk about for, for frustrations. Um, what they could control and what they couldn't and what they should focus on. Um, we also used a reflective jar experience because out of challenge came a lot of things that the team's unexpected wins really that the teams wanted to keep um, and things like that. So um, just to give you an idea of some of the exercises we used really to bring out some of the issues within those sessions. The feedback we've had, um, we, we, we've had, uh, we've literally hit out of 400 odd staff i think it's about 230 to 250 staff have used the um the hub and um, that, that we know of and over um I, th I think it was just about 90 people have given us feedback from those those people and we were getting various reflections really um most of the the people that fed back came to the group reflection with sessions um that they were saying that they you know and some people were saying they actually had been referred by their team managers as a group um but they still felt they would use the service again and that they would recommend the hub services and on that basis we're kind of pushing with our departmental management team who want to support as best they can that we keep this well-being hub going in some semblance um even after lockdown and that it seems to be a valuable service um even in its virtual form at the moment and here is some of the feedback we've had um from various people um in terms of you know how they felt it worked for them um any kind of potentially negative feedback has been you know that some people haven't enjoyed the virtual context um which is something we are not in control of um, and some people also um, would prefer to have more one-to-ones, but then we've encouraged them to contact us in order to do that. So um, that gives you an idea and a flavour, I think, of, of what we have done for the team. And I think there's huge lessons to be learned as we, we, we move forward, that there's a huge growing recognition, really, of you know the effects of working um, with trauma and with pressure on social workers and long that may continue in supporting well-being and resilience and, and, and that's the end of my um of, of my presentation so I'm, I'm sorry it's uh, a whistle stop but um i understand that the powerpoint can be shared by social work england and um it's been great to be part of today so thank you very much Hi, Sarah. Thank you. And um, I think just really, really pertinent to 
um, to share the story of Hampshire and your experience of thinking about well-being um, during what has been, you know, a really extraordinary year for all of us working, you know, personally and professionally. So I think it's really great to see the priority and the focus that Hampshire have given that. And I know that Hampshire's, you know, that's been across the board in lots of employers and local authorities, but it's really good that Hampshire have been able to share your experience. Um, we are going to take some questions at the end, um, but I think we want to make sure that we give all our speakers corners an opportunity to, to do their do their talk. And then we will take some questions at the end for those of you that may have questions. You can please post your questions in the chat if you have got any questions for Sarah or Tony so far. But now we're going to move on to our third and final speakers corner. Um, and I'm going to pass you over to Paula Swift from T's East Esk and Weir Valley and also Charlotte Golding who works for NICE who are going to lead us on our um, final speakers corner for today so I'm going to pass you over to those thank you hello yes um, I'm Paula Swift as said I'm the professional head of social work for T's Esk and Weir Valley's NHS Trust um, we also have Charlotte Golding who um, is from NICE we and we have two experts by experience and what we're going to look at today is how nice guidance um, can be used within sorry there, um, can be used within um, social work to ensure that service users have the opportunity to um, be part of the shared decision making and um, we're going to look at how that fits and also we're going to hear the expert by experiences stories um, about um, Sandra's going to talk about how um, the service users her social worker didn't listen to her and how that made her feel and then Keith's going to talk about his positive experience of um, social work involvement over to yourself Charlotte Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Charlotte Goulding, Social Care Policy and Practice Support Manager at NICE. Could you do the next slide please, Paula? So building on what Paula was talking about in terms of shared decision making, I just wanted to give you a bit of background from the NICE website, how we define shared decision making. We talk about it as when people are at the centre of decisions about their own treatment and care, and that when decisions are made to get together, it's important that care or treatment options are fully explored along with the risks and benefits, that different choices available to the person are discussed and that a decision is reached together with a health and social care professional. NICE is currently developing a guideline on shared decision making and that is due to publish this summer. So if it's something you're interested in, you might want to register as a stakeholder. But the guideline that we're going to really focus on in this session is service user experience in mental health services. And this guideline includes all the different components of what should enable someone to have a good experience in mental health services. So it could be a really helpful guideline for any social workers that are working with people in mental health settings. Can you do the next slide, please? So we've pulled out a couple of recommendations that we think are really relevant to this session. So this first one is under the heading relationships and communication. And Paul and I thought that this was a really important recommendation because it's really central to social work practice and, you know, really our values and ethics as social workers. Can you do the next one, please? And this is the other recommendation that we really want to focus on and you'll be hearing more about this later in the session and what it means in practice. And we chose this one because we felt that this really reflected what shared decision making actually means in practice. Can you do the next one, please? So I just wanted to talk a little bit about evidence informed practice. From my experience as a practicing social worker, I didn't routinely use NICE guidance or evidence in my practice. I think when I had a really complex situation, I would really often rely on the practice wisdom of my colleagues and I would talk it through with people and ask from their experience how they would approach cases. But I think, um, you know, it's really important that we do think as well as practice wisdom, 
to think about a range of information and evidence that might guide our practice and how we make decisions. And this is something that is also central to Social Work England professional standards. But for myself, it took me a while to really understand what evidence informed practice means. And I think on this slide, it's just trying to summarise the three different components. So obviously we need to really think about the person's values and their preferences, and that's central to our practice as a social worker. But we might also want to think about best available evidence. So that could be a range of different information and guides, and it might include nice resources as, as one source of information. But thinking about how we make decisions, it's weighing up all of that information and really using our professional judgment and not being a slave to any guideline, but to consider all the information together so that we do make the right decisions. Can you do the next slide, please? And this is this slide is just a, a range of nice guidance that might be helpful for you in your practice. In particular, people's experience of adult social care services might be helpful and also the guideline on decision making and mental capacity. Thanks, Paula. So what we're going to have now is Sandra talking about how um, the lack of engagement um, with her social worker and the f and the feelings of not being heard, how that impacted on her and how on reflection, if the social worker had used the nice guidance and guidelines when both herself and um, the social worker and Sandra felt stuck that there may have been more of a benefit. Do you want to tell your story, Sandra? Yeah, um, so my social worker, Bev, she was the most lovely person you could meet. I was referred to dental services about nine and a half years ago, I think it was, and it was all new to me. My family had experienced a devastating event. My eight-year-old daughter had been abused sexually. I was already what I would, with hindsight, describe as manic due to marital, marital difficulties, financial worries and my underlying mental health. I thought I had PTSD, depression and anxiety as my presenting problems. To cut a long story short, as I said to my social worker, who was the most lovely person, she came out and listened to me daily, but I was oblivious to my actual circumstances. We ended up going to a conference regarding my kids. I was told by the, a children's social worker, if your kids go on a protection plan, they will get access to not only the help that I was trying so, so hard to, to get, uh, but they'll be, uh, they be able to access other help as well for, for their well-being. On this basis, I voted yes for my kids to go on a plan. As it turns out, most of the professionals were voting no, but on my but on my lead, they, they were swayed a yes. I wanted what was best for my kids. There is a backstory about the nightmare trying to get my daughter access to sexual abuse counselling. My social worker allowed me to walk blindly into this meeting and do this when I was naive. I truly expected being honest would equal optimum support for my kids, but it was a total backfire. As I said, Bev was lovely and so nice, but I needed an advocate. I needed it explaining to me what was happening. I needed to understand the reality and the gravity, not walking, not walking thinking this is how I get my kids' needs met. I was unstable, in fact, very unstable, not in terms of suicidality, although I was at times, but in what I would describe as a manic and as manic and unable to cope. This brings me to my second point, which is probably my primary point. I have been diagnosed with traits of borderline personality disorder, emotionally unstable type, which I only found out about by accident months later. If I'd understood this, if I'd known this and understood this, had it been explained as an intelligent woman, I could have been prepared and assertive at the conference and could have reflected on my diagnosis and observed my behaviour, albeit not fully as I can now, but at least partially. Thank you for your time and listening. Thank you, Sandra. Keith, would you like to tell your story? Just dealing with the technicalities. I hope I'm on screen and people can hear. Yes? Yeah. Fine. We can. Yeah, my name is Keith Marsden and I'm a service user from what I describe as England's original and first holiday resort of Scarborough. I suffer from what I'm told is a very, fairly rare condition called dissociative fugue. For those of them, I'm told of it, F-U-G-U-E. 
This involves occasional brief periods of amnesia when I don't know who I am, but accompanied by unplanned and unintended travel. Uh, I don't know where I am. The first time this happened about 25 years ago, I finished up in Morton in the Marsh in the Cotswolds, which is some 250 miles or so away from my home. I had no idea where I was. I didn't know who I was. I'd been missing apparently for some 10 or so hours. And those hours I never ever later recalled. Uh, I was taken by ambulance to hospital in Cheltenham. No one knew what was wrong. I had all sorts of tests, head x-ray scans. My wife and son arrived from Scarborough. Uh, I didn't recognize them. Eventually they took me back home. Uh, the house seemed like a strange stranger's house, one I'd never been in before. But what I found really upsetting was that at the time we had uh, two Staffordshire Bull Terriers and they leapt on the settee next to me and lick, licked my face. And I then came to the conclusion and I was so distressed that the dogs obviously had a better memory than I had. Gradually, over several weeks, bits of memory came back and fell into place like a huge jigsaw. But I never regained that lost 10 hours or so. So since 1996, I've experienced other episodes of fugue and finished up in various places. London, Norfolk, Blackpool, Leeds, York, many others. Uh, and when the amnesia has not lasted so long, I've finished up nearer to home, places like Brillington and Whitby, which are only about 20 miles away, or I've been found in Scarborough itself. So in the last 25 years, I've received a lot of help from a lot of people, and I've experienced several uh, care coordinators, most of whom have told me what is being provided for me and what treatment will be given to me. And I have always been provided with what mental health staff consider is an appropriate care plan, but without much or if any consultation or involvement by myself. My best experience of all was when on my first appointment with a new care coordinator who was a social worker and part of the local integrated mental health team, this lady had obviously read all of my notes quite thoroughly and the, and the notes were very lengthy by then and we talked through what had helped and not helped in the past and we both agreed that my care plan needed updating. Having read that I was originally a, a journalist on daily newspapers, this social worker asked if I'd like to be involved in producing the care plan. So obviously I said yes, of course. The social worker took me from the interview room into the team's open plan office, set me at, uh, sat me at the keyboard of a computer terminal, and together we formulated a plan, discussing and agreeing between us what was most important to me, and I typed it all up. This plan was much more meaningful to me and more relevant and extremely helpful when further crises arose. For a few weeks before this care planning session, I'd been having regular sessions with a psychologist and including eye movement and desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR. And he'd suggested it after this that I revisited Morton in the Marsh in a planned and cautious way. The social worker suggested I incorporated this into the care plan and included for me safety precautions, such as suggesting I wear some kind of identity tag either around my neck or wrist and also liaised with Gloucestershire crisis, mental health crisis team to make them aware of my condition and when we would be visiting and to be uh, on alert and aware as it were. When I went down with my wife and son and we stayed overnight in Morton in the Marsh, looked at Cheltenham Hospital, looked around, found the place where I'd found myself as it were uh, all those years ago. No effect at all either on me, either adverse or good. It was just a pleasant visit to a beautiful area. I think this is a really good and effective example of co-production, joint working, or whatever title is currently in vogue. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. And I think what Keith's um, experience has shown that if you were to look at the NICE guidance that we talked about, the service user experience in adult mental health services, what the social worker did with Keith is um, the worked, they worked in partnership with Keith they offered um, treatment that provided hope, um, comprehensive written information was provided, 
Keith was given treatment options. The care plan was developed jointly. Um, Keith was supported to develop strategies around risk. And the crisis plan that was put in place was co-produced that considered early warning signs and coping strategies. And also importantly, that the family were involved with this. Um, so I think that just demonstrates, given the Sandra's experience where she didn't feel heard, she didn't feel that there had been a collaborative approach, didn't feel that in um, any way that the any plans were dealt with jointly, it just shows that when something's done right, and, and Keith talks about this experience as being something positive, and that it promoted trust and hope for the future. Um, and just to um, conclude, um, so looking at this, um, the importance of using shared decision making, nice guidance and social work English standards, um, that it using nice guidance, it uses evidence based practice, um, that shared decision making promotes transparency and chime factors. Um, it promotes the rights, strengths and well-being of people, families and the community, which is the Social Work England principle. Um, that collaboration establishes and maintains trust and confidence, which again is another Social Work England principle. It ensures accountability for the quality of your own practice and decisions made, and meaning that you have that confidence that when you're engaging with the service user, that they remain central to everything we do, which again is a social work principle. And it promotes the right to participation. Um, social workers should promote the full involvement and participation of people using their services in ways that enable them to be empowered in all aspects of decisions and actions affecting their lives. And that is part of the code um, of ethics for social workers. And that's the conclusion. Thank you. Hi, Paula. Um... Thank you so much for such a powerful um, presentation and for um, to especially to Keith and Sandra for sharing your own personal experience. And I don't know about everyone else, but I think that they were really powerful stories and really important for us to hear that um, and to hear that account and learn as well. So thank you. Um, um, we have had, before we take questions, we have had an illustrator with, a, with us today. So Nifty Fox, who is also known as Laura, has been with us today and um, has been hopefully illustrating some work. I don't know, Laura, if you're able to join us now and, and um, share anything that you've been I, doing. I am indeed. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to do something fancy with my camera, which fingers crossed should, uh, should work. So... Um, I'm looking at you guys to tell me if this does work or not. So let me just show you what I've been drawing today. So hopefully you should be able to see my iPad screen there. Can, can I get a nod if, if you can see that? And I'm going to spotlight you. Thank you so much. So you can't see my face anymore, but this is what I've been drawing. So we've had our three incredible speakers. I was only meant to describe one of you, but I felt like that was really unfair. So I've done everybody in the spirit of fairness. So we had Tony beginning with her journey through um, local authority and um, work through to mental health in the NHS and looking at how um, the social care and social worker role within um, the patient care team was so crucial. And I took from this a lot about the benefits here. So this is the top left about having a social worker involved in that process. And it was quite striking that we had improved communication, improved care quality, reduced stay and also preventing bed shortages, were just some of the examples. So that was from Tony. We then moved across to the right to Sarah, who was talking about staff well-being. And obviously we have some key issues around work-life balance, health and safety, um, safety during visits, the disconnection between yourself, your team and the people that you serve, grief and loss, and also this idea of secondary trauma. But then we talked about the well-being hub and how this has been really helpful because it's given social workers an online resource where they can reflect on what's going on. And they have all of the things at their fingertips to help improve their mental well-being um, during this time. And I really liked that it promoted this connection. And then at the bottom here, we've had um, Paula and Charlotte going through and our um, amazing guest speakers 
looking at how we can use NICE guidelines for shared decision making and um, through the lens of service user experiences in mental health, adult mental health. It was really important to understand the idea of evidence informed practice. I know this is quite small at the bottom, but I promise you will be able to see it on an A4 piece of paper um, that we talked about best. That it's the best evidence with professional input and also taking into account values and preferences. And I took some um, examples from our guest speakers as to what happens when shared decision making doesn't take place. In general, this leads to misinformation, a lack of the right support and a negative impact on the family and feeling like you're not listened to. However, the difference that shared decision making makes is that it enables the right information to be given to the service user, an incredibly person centred approach, which means everybody's bought into what's happening, which means you can get the right support and you have improved safety through this co-production. And all of this relates back to the social work principles. So that, in a nutshell, is what you've been looking at today. Wow, thank you, Laura. What an amazing, what amazing summary. You know, when you did that summary, then you almost forget what we just listened to. Do you know what I mean? Because there's so <laughs> yeah. much information there. And I think you captured it really, really amazing. So thank you so much. Great work. No um, and obviously, thank Laura you. will be with us for the rest of the week. She's dipping in and out of certain sessions. And obviously, this recording will also be available. We have got five minutes left of today's session. So I just wondered whether there was any questions that anyone wanted to or ask any of our um, three the three speakers corners today so obviously we had Tony and then we had um, uh, Sarah and then Charlotte and Paula we have also got a survey that we would like you to spend a couple of minutes filling in um, my colleague Iwana has just added that to the chat. We would really welcome getting some feedback on today's session. We're here learning. This is the first time we've done this. So we want to learn and develop. So any chance you get to fill out the survey online, that would be great. We'd really welcome that. And obviously, if anyone does have any questions for our speakers, now is the chance. Philippa, we have a question in the in the chat. If yep. we're, we're going to get the written summary, and if we, yeah. So we're not providing a written summary, so the recording will be made available on our website. Um, and obviously, if you want to get um, contact written details, we can put the links for Charlotte and Paula and our speakers. Um, we can provide those links for you. Um, but we are providing a written summary, but also the images that Laura is collating will also be collated and be available um, after Social Work Week as well. At the moment, we don't have any other questions. Okay. okay. So Sarah has put her email in there as well. Oh, L Laura's written summary. Yes, Jaswinda, sorry. Um, it will be available. Obviously, we're going to wait for this week's events to be done, and then we will look at how we best collate the images that, that Nifty Fox has taken, and they will be available. The title of this session is Speaker's Corner for Monday. Um, so... Thank you so much, everybody. Um, for those of you that are social workers, just a reminder that obviously you can reflect on today's session and in particular some of the, the messages that you've heard from Tony and Sarah and Sandra and Keith and Paula and Charlotte, and you can use those as your CPD. You'll be hearing us say that quite a lot this week, um, but it's a great opportunity to evidence your learning and how we are developing as professionals. Um, and that's it from me. Um, I'd just like to say, take this opportunity to say thank you for those of you that can. If you could fill out the survey, that would be fabulous. And I'd just like to say thank you once more to all our speakers for giving up their time today um, and for sharing their, their stories with us. Thank you very much, everyone. Please enjoy the rest of Social Work Week. There are um, more um, there are spaces left on some of our keynote events and some of our networking lunches. And again, most of it will be recorded and available on our website afterwards. So thank you very much once more. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of the day.